Rosie, are we ready to begin the meeting? Um, we sure are. We are still expecting Louis to come in, but um, he might be just a little bit late. Greg, sh should we go? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'd like to announce it uh, assumes it's 8.30. I don't know because we don't have a clock here. Um, it is 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> July 14th, 2023, and I'd like to announce the meeting of the SDC Board of Administration uh, meeting today. Um, do we have a quorum, Rosie? Yes, Mr. President, we do have a quorum with the following members absent, Thomas Battaglia, Natasha Kalora, Luis Machi, and Louis Gwen as of the moment, but he may be joining us in a little bit. Fine, thank you. But we have a quorum with the remaining. Yes, we sure do, yes. Right. So I'd like to remind people when there's an action item uh, present, please use the board voting system to record uh, your moving and uh, providing a second on the motion in addition to recording your vote. So let's move on to section three public comment. Uh, do we have any public comment today, Rosie? We do not have a, any public comment for today, Mr. President. Good, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to section four, approval of the consent agenda items. Uh, this is service uh, retirements, uh, deferred retirement option plan, the drop entries, the deferred uh, retirement option plan, drop retirements, and the training program. Uh, so before I call for a motion for the approval of consent agenda items, would a board member like to pull a consent agenda item for a separate vote, or do we vote on all four of these? All together. All together, okay. So hearing no objections, um, uh, to pull a consent agenda item, um, may I have, please please have a motion and a second to approve items A through D. Oh, we do, okay. Hang on a second. Here we go. Would any board member like to speak on any of these items? Okay, hearing none, uh, we have a motion before the board, so please record your vote. And with all votes in, Mr. President, this motion passes 8-0. Great. Thank you very much, Rosie. So uh, let's move on to business operations. And um, uh, we have a business operation uh, information item on the agenda, which is the actual aerial experience study. So um, I think, Marcel, are you going to introduce this today? I am. I'm going to get us started on this. Thank so you. good morning, everyone. Every three years, SD SERS does an experience study. And during that experience study, or actually I should say every three years, our actuary does an experience study on our behalf. And during that experience study, they look at all of our assumptions, our methodologies, and determine whether they think we should make adjustments to any of them. That will be presented to you in September, our regular triennial review. This morning, we have Jean Kalwarski here from Chiron for an educational presentation to the board to go over some of the methodologies and the amortization periods in advance of that meeting in September. Um, and that was at the request of the board to have some additional educational information before we do the big study in September. And we also have with us on the phone, Alice Alsberg. Good morning, Alice. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I appreciate you guys speaking into the microphone directly so I can hear it clearly as well. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jean and Alice for their presentation. Thank you. Good morning. So um, what we're going to talk about um, in connection to the amortization policy is uh, SD SERS funding objectives, things that we've gone over with you before. And uh, we're gonna spend a bit of time on history, you know, how do we get here as far as all these different amortization periods, and then we'll conclude with what, what options you have to decide. Your funding objective policy is in your charters and um, there it is up on the screen. It's uh, a goal of achieving a funded ratio between 90 and 110 percent, with the overarching goal of being 100 percent funded for each of the plan sponsors. We've talked about how funding objectives uh, have to balance four different things. Uh, 
benefit security is very important. Stable and predictable cost is very important. And intergenerational equity and cost sustainability. But sometimes these different factors work against each other and it becomes a balance. So we're going to talk about the elements of this year's funding policy, but I'm going to turn it over to Alice to start. Great. Thanks, Jane. So in the SD SERS funding policy, it does outline the elements of the funding policy, which are related to the actuarial decisions that are made with the board through the direction and advice of the actuary of Chiron. There's the actuarial assumptions, which we are in the process of reviewing currently with the experience study, as Marcel said, we'll be bringing the results of that experience study to you in September. The actuarial funding method, so currently the plan uses the entry age normal funding method. Actuarial uh, asset smoothing method, the plan employs a 25% uh, smoothing method to mitigate the volatility of the assets, the actuarial value of assets compared to the market value of assets. And then there's the amortization method, which is the main portion of, or the bulk of our presentation today will focus on the amortization methods of the plan. On slide five, we outline the details of the current amortization policy. So within the amortization policy, there are set periods for amortizing the various unfunded portions that occur year over year. So experience gains and losses are amortized over 15 years. Assumption and method changes are currently amortized over 20 years. And actually prior to 2018, those were being amortized over 30 years, but the shorter period at 20 years, which is currently um, in play, was came about as a reflection on the different balancing the funding objectives, making sure ensuring intergener intergenerational equity, and that shorter period of 20 years was more in line with the plan's objectives for funding. Benefit changes amortized over five years for the city and 20 years for the poor in the airport. Any funding surplus, which we are not looking at just yet, would be amortized over 30 years. And then the payment pattern. So each of the layers or bases that are amortized are amortized either as a level percent of pay or a level dollar. So for the city's open plans, each of the amortization layers are amortized as a level percent of pay. So they grow at the rate of the salary inflation assumption, which is 3.05%. And for the non-police plans, which was the closed portion of the plan, those bases are amortized over a level dollar. In addition to those elements, there's the UAL payment floors. And the UAL payment floor was established in 2018 and stated that until the UAL is fully funded, the city will at minimum pay the 275.5 million floor and the poor 13.3 million for the UAL payment floor. And then the overriding limit is no negative amortization. And what that means is when you look at the principal balance of the unfunded, that the payment at least covers the interest each and every year of the principal balance of the unfunded. And uh, Alice, I just wanna add when you talked about level percent of pay, level dollar. Um, all the plans are open now, so that will be one of the uh, decisions that uh, needs to be discussed today. We're on slide six. So on slide six, we show the projections for the city. In the upper graph, we're showing the funded ratio is the percents across the top. The gray bar is actual liability, the line, the market value of assets. So based on the 2022 valuation, the city was 76% funded, and it's projected to be 100% funded with the 2035 valuation. In the lower graph, we are showing the contributions, the member contributions in blue and the employer contributions, the ADC in gold. Based on the 2022 valuation, that fiscal year 2024 ADC came in at $400 million. And, and another topic we'll be discussing at the end is that cliff that you see um, around 2036 where the, the payments drop significantly. I'm on slide seven, Alice. 
And the port has a similar picture. The 2022 valuation, the port came in at 80% funded and the ADC for the port for the 2024 fiscal year was 19 million. And we see the effect of that UAL payment floor holding the ADC consistently at around 19 million until the unfunded is paid off. On slide eight, the airport has a different picture given the airport's funding policy, that their internal funding policy that we've talked about through various board meetings. They are at 95% funded and their ADC, the actual determined contribution, sits around five million for the next uh, 15 years before it, we see it bounce around in the middle years of the projection period due to the various amortization actually gain bases, which become fully amortized and then bump up the employer contribution because of the remaining loss bases in those periods. So how did we get here? Well, in 1965, the system was using a 30-year closed period for paying off the unfunded. And as the years progressed, 1991 came around and they reset it again to another 30 years closed period. In 2007, this is when Chiron came into the picture as the actuary for the system, the uh, board elected to fund the existing 2007 UAL over a 20 year period and then establish layers in every subsequent year for the future experience gains and losses, assumption changes, plan changes, et cetera. And then comes 2012 when the plan closed, all of the non-police UAL, and it was about 65% of the unfunded was attributed to the non-police portion of the, of the UAL, was converted from a level percent of pay into a level dollar with the plan closure. And then in 2017, a glide path was established for two of the outstanding bases for the large uh, losses from the 2009 Great Recession and from that 2012 established non-police UAL were set to a five-year glide path, which smoothed out the then cliff. And in 2018, based on the 2018 valuation, that UAL payment floor was established for both the city and the port. <laughs> on slide 10 and 11, I, I have so a in question. our actual evaluation reports, we have question. table five. Uh, Alice, there um, is Alice, mm -hmm. th there's a question. Alice, can you can you just spend a little bit of time helping me understand why we went from level percentage of pay to level dollar, and then what did that mean for for how much the city had to pay? Yes, excellent question. Okay, so if we could leave it on slide ten here, and uh, go ahead and look. So it was that item eleven, so the base eleven, that non-police UAL. In 2012, with the plan closure, the, um, that portion of the unfunded attributable to the non-police portion was all switched to level percent of pay because it's a closed portion of the plan and the salary base would not be increasing at a rate of, at a salary increase rate like the remainder of the plan. The payment pattern was set to a level dollar. And when you're switching from a level percent to a level dollar, that actually the payments in the early years are higher than the payments in the later years. And under a level percent, the payments are lower in the early years and higher in the later years as that pay, the assumed pay grows and the amortization grows at that assumed pay rate. And, and, and let me just um, supplement that. Level percent of pay for an open plan is done so that you would have a budget as a predictable percentage of payroll. But the moment you close the plan, no new hires are coming in, so you won't, ha you won't have that growing payroll. And so, uh, and also the accounting rules back then dictated something like that. We're still on slide 10 or 11, Alice, mm -hmm. your choice. So, and to add to the complexity, in slide 11, the bases that are here, bases 12 through 28, 
Each of these initial amounts, there's a portion which is being amortized as a level dollar and a portion that's being amortized as a level percent of pay, continuing to keep that split between police and non-police due to the plan closure at the time. Slide On 12. slide 12, this is the next two slides. These are new, a new way that we're showing, uh, we're showing the board how to look at the total UAL and how it runs out over the course of the amortization period. So in the very first bar on the left in 2022, the net total UAL for the city sits at 2.8 billion. That's the red line. And every one of the different colored um, segments of that bar represents one of the 28 established bases. And so we see how that total UAL balance runs out as the amortization schedule goes into the future until the end uh, year here in 2049. So, and I'm sorry to interrupt. In conjunction with that on slide no, no, 13. We, we, we're Alice, the, uh, we have a question. Mm -hmm. So ah, okay. this slide, the run out, it, it shows the payoff, no UAL by like 2048, but I thought you said by 2035 we would be. It's, it's these slides do not reflect the, um, uh, the floor payment. Ah, okay, thank you. Ah, uh, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. I missed uh, stating that um, that the floor is not reflected here. So this is just seeing how those that amortization schedule works out. Mm -hmm. We're on slide 13. And on slide 13, we show in a similar graphic the UAL payment itself. Again, this is without recognition for the UAL payment floor. So between 2022 and 2028 or 2027, that payment rate stays steady. And then one of the larger um, loss bases drops off because that's when that initial 2007 is paid off. So we lose 40, drop off 40 million, and then it staggers its way down through the payment schedule until 2049. And again, you see in this slide um, sort of a glide path going on there, but because of the floor payment, that, as you see later, that's <clears throat> uh, not going to happen unless you got rid of the floor. So we have been making projections every year, and you're now go going to see how our projections are incredibly wrong every year. <laughs> because <laughs> we, we assume you know, level uh, returns, but in fact, that's never going to happen. But I, I just wanted to give you a sense, uh, going back to 2009, this follows the Great Recession. And on all these charts, I think the, uh, you, you should focus on the bottom graph, because on the top graph, you're always going to see lines that uh, reach 100% funding because that's, that's how the uh, funding method works. So it'll always be 100% on the top graph, but it's the bottom graph, the pattern of the uh, uh, city payments. And here, following the Great Recession, you saw a great jump in, in city's payments. And this graph is showing city payments as a percentage of payroll. This is back when the city was an open, uh, all open plan. And on the far left column, you see returns that are reflective of the discount rate at the time. At that time, it was 7.75. So 2014, just a, year, just a year later, 2015, that projection changed because we had a market rebound. The system earned over 13%, and now the percentages are much less. Again, we're at 7.75, far left column. 2011, we had a great return, over 20%, and we use that to help lower the discount rate, far left column, seven and a half. But you see how from year to year, the patterns don't, uh, the patterns change significantly. And then in 2012, we have yet another, no, we have a bad return, 0.4% return. And we're showing the contribution rate escalating to up to 90% of payroll. I'm going to turn it over to Alice shortly, but in 2013, we lowered the discount rate to seven and a quarter. Plan is closed, largely closed. And the police are still open. So now we're showing in the bottom graph city dollar contributions. So Alice, you could take it from here to 2022, and then I'll come back. 
Sounds great. So we're switching, as Jean said, uh, we switched the projections to reflect uh, dollar payments for the ADC rather than the rate of pay with the plan closure. And uh, here again in 2013, we're seeing a cliff out into the future. And we move along from 2014, the contributions continue to show a cliff into the future, 2015, that discount rate was reduced from 7.125% to 7%, a smaller cliff out into the future. In 2016, that 7% discount rate, and in 2016, the cliff was 10 years out. And this was a topic of conversation in the 2016, 2017 years. In 2017, there were excellent returns above 13%, and the board decided to take advantage of that situation of the favorable returns, reduce the discount rate by 50 basis points over two years, so 25 basis points a year, and implement the glide path to smooth out the cliff. Now, all of those changes were implemented, keeping in mind balancing those funding objectives. Uh, Alice, I just want to add, um, if you look at 2016 versus 2017, you could see the impact of that glide path there. Um, just just mm -hmm. inf for informational purposes for the board, the implementation of that glide path will cost, uh, even though it has a smoother pattern of contributions, it costs over $100 million in extra interest to the city. So, uh, Alice, I'm on slide 24. 24, so the 2018 projections are very similar to 2017 because the market returns came in close to expected. And in 2019, we see the effect of the UAL payment floor in the projections. 2019, that cliff is 14 years out. Then we move on to 2020. Uh, 2020, be, unfortunately, was a bad return year, 0.2%. Uh, that be, cliff got pushed out 18 years. Alice, and you see how volatile that cliff is from Alice, the return. Uh, uh, let mm -hmm. me just hang on back on 2019. If you look at 2018 and 19, the big difference is the implementation, as Alice said, of, of the floor payment. So what the floor payment really did is it eliminated the glide path. Mm -hmm. So I'm back on your 2020 projection, Alice. Okay, so with those 2020 projections, we see that cliff gets pushed out. 2021, that cliff is shortened, 25% market return for the year. So such a strong return really helps help plan and with UAL payment for, um, put, brought that 100% funding closer uh, to date. Then moving to 2022, where we stand now, based on the most recently completed valuation, that cliff is 13 years out again because in 2022 there are poor returns at negative 1.4%. So over the last five years, we really see how that cliff moves back and forth, really based on the market returns. So now we're going to, uh, looking at this 2022 20, projection that Alice just showed on slide 28, that's assuming 6.5% return. We're now going to show you what the, that same projection would be, but with returns that mirror different periods in history. And all this is leading up to, when we get to the end, you've got some decision points on the floor, level percent of pay, and um, the amortizations. And, um, I think you'll get a sense um, seeing at these historical periods how you cannot rely on, on a graph like you're looking at right now, uh, 20, uh, slide 28, because it's not going to happen. So going forward, uh, again, we haven't done the 23 valuation. That was just the last month. Uh, but this is based on the 22 valuation. If the 1930s were to uh, take place, again, uh, focus more on the bottom graph, the city contributions, the gold bars. And the red line on all the bottom graphs I'm about to show would be the baseline, meaning if you earn six and a half every year. Here, the 1930s to 60 returns is bringing in uh, the recession back in the uh, early 30s. But then one year later, uh, we had a, a fabulous, well, not one year later, a decade later, 1940 to 70, okay, yeah. 
you had much better returns, and now you see uh, the pattern of the city payments, in fact, go to zero after 2014. 1950s, leave it to Beaver era, is um, even more uh, spectacular as far as the returns, and you see the uh, city contributions ending in 2028 and not taking, uh, coming back until 2054. And the plan's funded status at the top is like 100, peaking at 189%. 1960 to 1990, <coughs> I see a different <coughs> pattern. We had some uh, poor uh, decades in there, or poor years in there. Again, the red line is always, you know, if you earn six and a half each and every year. Then 70 to 2000, we start out with some uh, not so strong years, but then the uh, 80s and 90s uh, take hold, and uh, that's where the city contribution would go to zero. And the 80s to 2010 picks up the very strong returns um, of the 80s and 90s. And then the uh, period 1990 to 2020. The point in showing you all those is we talked about the cliff. Who knows when that cliff's really gonna come because the returns are gonna be up and down, up and down. So we're gonna conclude our presentation with the discussion of the amortization options. And the first one is a possible glide path. And that's just depicting one possible way you could do it. I mentioned earlier that the glide path previously cost the city over $100 million in interest. But again, this glide, this uh, cliff here is 15 years out. Who knows when it's gonna happen? Uh, you can tell from my comments, I, in our opinion, it's kind of premature to be worrying about a cliff that far out. Level percent of pay versus level dollar amortization for all layers. So again, the red line is the current funding. So you see the gold bars are slightly lower than the red line in the early years and then slightly higher in the out years. <clears throat> That's one of the options that has some rationale, strong rationale, simply because the plans are no longer closed and that was the basis for going to level dollar. The ULL payment floor. The red line in this graph is reflective of the floor. If you remove the floor, you see the gold lines. So you see the glide path reemerges, but you have got much higher payments in the out years. If we uh, remove the floor and went to level percent of pay, it's not really that different um, than the graph before. So, so the level percent of pay versus level dollar is the least impactful of, of these three things. So these are the questions for the board to consider. Should the floor payment be removed? As I mentioned earlier, if you do, the cliff is uh, uh, gone. If not, should we establish another glide path? Uh, but you saw those projections over time that you're constantly having a different outlook. And in our opinion, it's probably pre premature to be dealing with a cliff that's that far off. And then there's a level percent of pay level dollar, which really is the smallest impactful change. Uh, and, and if you decide that, do we just do it prospectively or retroactively? So that concludes our formal presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Thank you both for this. Uh, I can't say I've got my mind wrapped around all of it. It's a lot to chew on. But one question comes to mind of, do we need to change anything? You don't have to change anything. Okay. Um, and yesterday, and we'll report on this to the full board, we had a preliminary performance report, very preliminary, on uh, portfolio returns, which might be on the order of 4 to 5 percent. So. And, and I gather, talking with Marcel, that the city has implemented and announced a series of salary increases to be implemented over the next several years. How far out, uh, at least, Marcel? Can you summarize for everybody? It's over the next three years. So this was salary increases for all non-safety 
um, that were significant. It was about almost 23% over three years. So that also has an impact. 23% generally yes. speaking, because there are a yeah. lot of exceptions. So it's, it's in increments. So it starts July 1 of 24, right. or July 1, yeah, July 1 of 23, 23, January of 24, July of 24, January of 25, July of 25. And none so of that's that reflected in any of these slides here from Chiron, I assume. So Chiron assumes a 3.05% increase. And in this next fiscal year that we've actually now entered in fiscal 24, all unions are receiving more than 3.05. And as I said, the non-safety members are getting 10%, 5 July 1, 5 January 1. So those that's not reflected in here because that's happening in the future. Sure. So we won't see that till we, we really won't see the full impact of that first year until we do the July, or the June 30, 2024 valuation. So remember we're working right now on the June 30, 23 valuation because that just ended two weeks ago. So that July, that June 30, 24 valuation will have that first year of increases which for most general members is a 10% increase over that one year. That is what you will see in the city's fiscal 26 payment. Right. So these are way downstream that you'll see these impacts. And there also were um, some significant, what the, the city calls special salary adjustments. So this is looking at specific classifications that are um, under market. And so in addition to the regular across the board increases, there are some special salary adjustments. And, and that part is, of this is because there was what, a salary freeze for as long as 11 years? It was about 11 years. So for those of you remember back, so the city had pretty much implemented salary freezes for about six years before Prop B. Then when Prop B was passed, the city negotiated with their unions and implemented a five-year freeze. So for a significant population of the city, there's been, there was an 11-year pay freeze. And so the city is trying to catch up to bring their employees to market mm -hmm. because they were, in some cases, significantly below market. And they did that with the police several years ago and did it over three years, and now they're picking it up with the general members. So I guess trying to put different pieces together is the, 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 um, what Chiron is showing us is the best they can provide us with the information we have today, but we need to try to bear in mind there's a certain known reality into the future as to changes in our liabilities that aren't yet reflected in, in these tables. Yeah, and not just the, the two things you mentioned, which was investment return and sal the salary increases, but also with the experience study being performed, the assumptions is your, might Is your mic on? With the experience study being performed, we may have new assumptions. Absolutely. I mean, no one has a crystal ball that's worth anything. Right. Do you mean changing current assumptions, or are you saying introducing new assumptions? Changing current assumptions. Got it. If, if that's what the experience dictates. Okay. Can I have a couple questions? So as I'm trying to wrap my head around page 42, it would be helpful if I can, or if you can guide us or guide me, in thinking about how page 42 ties back to page three. So when you look at page three, there's, a, there's where you have the Venn diagram of the four, the you, four objectives. You want me to go? That's, That's fine. That, I, you don't have to. But yes. So on page three, you have the four objectives. It, it isn't always perfect. It's there's tensions between those four. Yes. And they shift and they turn. Mm -hmm. So to help me contextualize these recommendations, it would be, it would be helpful for me to think about how these will shift as a function of the recommendation. So, and, and you don't have to play that out, but. Well, we, we, so if, if, just playing that out. So if you're, if the example is, should the floor payment be removed? If yes, the, if yes, the cliff is nearly gone. If I look back to this diagram of the funding objectives, does that, shift some benefits to cost sustainability? Does it make intergeneration equity less, less prominent? So helping me understand how these decisions so, have ramifications here onto this diagram would be super helpful. Okay, so, uh, it could um, be later, it doesn't have to be now. But. No, I, I could do it now. So benefit security um, is shown at the top graph. And I, I think with or without uh, the cliff, you know, you're approaching 100% funded. So I don't think benefit security is impacted. Uh, 
cost uh, sustainability, um, one could argue that um, paying the lower goal bars in those early years and, and later on uh, might be more sustainable to the city, but, but we don't know. We don't know what the city's uh, real budget threshold is. Mm -hmm. And as far as intergenerational equity, you are spreading costs over a further time frame as compared to the red line in the bottom bar where it's all front loaded. Did I miss one of the four? Yes. I don't have, I did sustain, oh, predictability. Um, I don't think, with all the charts I showed, the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and as you mentioned, no one has a crystal ball that's worth anything. So uh, I don't think the predictability one is uh, impacted at all by this. And then the level percent of pay, um, I've mentioned a few times, it's a mi minimal impact here. It's a little bit less now and a little bit more later. I think the rationale for this is more of, um, it's logical because the plans are now open, so I treat it as a closed plan. Um, then the, I guess we talked, oh, no, the glide path. The glide path, um, you could make an argument, it put, uh, pushes you into a sustainability argument, but I mentioned earlier uh, the two glide paths that were previously implemented uh, cost the city an extra $100 million plus $100 million in interest payments. This type of glide path you look at here would probably cost a lot more than that. But again, the sustainability uh, question is something really only the city really knows. You know, uh, I don't think we nor the system has a feel for what the city can sustain. So that cost sustainability is the big driver or the factor that's most impacted by the whole glide path, which when you say glide path, do you mean is that uh, re-amortizing over like taking the and basis like smoothing? I know it's not smooth. Yes, but, yes. But it's trying to create a pattern like that red line is up there where you would have lower payments um, for a while, but then on the far right, you'd have higher payments. So even doing that does, in your opinion, does that put benefit security at risk? I mean... We've done it before, and we've still, despite discount rates being reduced over and over and all other assumptions, we still gained over 20 years, like 10% on, you know, getting yeah. towards funding despite all of that. So could we still make progress towards fully funding and you, still, you know what I mean? Like You, you would still get there, but I, I think all those charts I showed with our previous predictions from 2009 to 2022, show that you can't rely that this picture is gonna happen. In fact, you, you, you can rely that this picture is not gonna happen. I'm talking about the gold bars. <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're trying to solve a theoretical issue that really isn't gonna take place. And, and since it's 15 years out, it just, it, to us, doesn't make sense to be dealing with it now. So uh, again, I think the, the only, uh, um, option that you know might be worth considering is this one the level percent of pay or or the floor too but um there's the floor uh -huh. and the reason yeah. you're not so sure about the floor is just because the way things are going the city's payments well over the floor that's been established anyway is that is um that what you mean? also the things that we just discussed earlier um you had the five percent return You've got the increasing salaries uh, that are taking place in the, if you, uh, over the next short term, and then we may have new assumptions. So it might be best to, re if you want to consider the, the floor, um, let's see what the numbers are after those things take place. Mr. Kowarski, a few questions. Um, First of all, Cliff, I, I actually spoke to the head of one of the major unions regarding that 25% pay increase. And of course said, hey, it's great to see that pay increase, but obviously that's gonna affect the city's payment on pensions, right? And uh, <clears throat> he, he said that that was 
part of their calculation in terms of what their costs were going to be long term, which is logical. I mean, they, they've got to know that that's going to come forth. Um, but Mr. Kowarski, I have questions in two areas, one about the discount rate and one about what we're talking about here. So in April, you made a presentation to the city council, uh, right? And it was a really good presentation. I watched it and found it fascinating. Also, it was great to see that the city council was so engaged, you know, during, during your presentation as to what was going on. And, I, and Marcel was there and kicked in. But then a, a article comes out in the Union Tribune a couple days after that saying, the city's actuary says he'll present the pension board with options this summer for scrapping an existing plan to aggressively pay down the debt with annual city contributions ranging from 420 million to 450 million over the next 12 years. And it goes on to talk about other things. Now, obviously you're not the city's actuary, you're our actuary, right? right. Um, and I'm not suggesting that what was reported in the Union Tribune is accurate. Um, based on what I observed from uh, your presentation, that wasn't the case. But I wanted to emphasize that I would agree with the idea that we not make any changes, um, with one exception, and that is that the level percent of pay, only because to me that's what you're telling us is that that's a technical correction that changed because of Prop B and we should go back to a normal way of looking at things, actuarially speaking. I, I, am I correct in understanding that's basically your point? Yes. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about this issue of intergenerational equity. And as you've pointed out, um, in the late 1990s, the pension system was almost 100% funded, right? It was just right there. And along co come MP1 and MP2, which was Manager's Proposal 1 and Manager's Proposal 2, in which the city, shall we say, kindly collaborated with the pension board to underfund the system, um, resulting in references to San Diego as Enron by the sea and so on and so forth. Then the voters came along at the recommendation of the mayor and implemented Proposition B. Um, which have had huge impacts on our overall funding, it seems to me, um, along with some other things. But from an intergenerational equity perspective, we were virtually 100% funded back in the late 1990s, and now we're at 72% or whatever it may be, some, somewhere in that ballpark. From an intergenerational equity perspective, in my mind, it is this generation's obligation to fix the mess that was made by this generation, rather than any concept of spreading that out so that generations two or three decades down the line are paying for the mistakes of, of this generation. So I'm not asking you to agree or disagree with that. I'm more you know, making a, a comment in that regard. And I, I would suggest that we look at that level percent of pay and so on um, just as a technical issue, but, but leave the rest as is. The second question I have is about the discount rate. The discount rate, as I understand it, um, is essentially intended to be equivalent to the anticipated rate of return on investments. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And so they should be in sync, basically. Um, somewhere back in the 2000s, uh, a decision was made by a former composition of this board to reduce the discount rate from 8% over time down to 6.5%, um, where we are now. And so what the board assumed at that point was that going forward, we don't have a realistic chance of getting an 8% return on investment. And the best we think we're going to get out of this is 6.5%, somewhere in that ballpark. And I recall at the March meeting that um, Alice, and I don't know if she can still hear us or hear, but 
made a point that... Yes, I am. Okay. She said, it's very painful in terms of the contributions to even lower your discount rate a quarter of a percent. And she went on to say that the pain is that the sponsor and the employees, both of them, pay a lot more money based on lowered expectations of return on investment in the form of the level of the discount rate, right? Okay. So what I'm not understanding is this. I, I've gone back and looked at SDSER's return on investment over the past 10 years from 20, uh, sorry, 2013 to 2022, so just the last 10 years, and it averaged 8.72% during that period. And then the 10 years prior, uh, 2003 to 2012, 8.03%. Now, maybe I'm cherry picking, I just picked you know, the last 10 years and the 10 years before that. But at our last meeting, this board got a, received a, uh, an investment plan from Aon, from our investment advisors, in which our investment advisors said if uh, they anticipated with that new plan that our return on investment would be, I believe, 7.68% over the long haul. Um, so we have two different situations here in which historic returns seem to be well above 6.5% since the time the discount rate was de decreased, at least from my back of the envelope ca calculations. Actually, I did use Excel. Um, and, um, and we have this board approving a, an investment plan going forward on, under which we have endorsed the idea from our investment advisor that that should return and I believe it's 7.68%, but it's over 7.5%. My question is, is it ethical, is it ethical for a pension system to have a discount rate of 6.5% when it has endorsed and believes that it can uh, achieve a return on investment of over seven and a half percent. Can those be out of alignment ethically? If, if I could jump in, I, I, Chris, if, and I apologize for jumping in here. I, I really don't believe this is a, an ethical conversation. We have professional standards from the investment uh, community and, and how they make capital assumptions. And we also have actuarial standards of practice on how they recommend investment return um, assumptions. And so, I, I think it's a very good question to ask our actuary with regards to how do you harmonize those two things? But I really don't think it's an ethical question. I think it's more of a technical question, if you could. Okay, um, I'm gonna not ask if it's ethical. Do you think it's a good idea? Um, well, this is something that we're gonna be presenting in September. In fact, this, you know, uh, that's a part of the experience study, but in the past, in lowering it, we were not that far apart from what the market expectations were. I, and, and, and I'm not suggesting that so, the board at that time but, but didn't me, make a reasonable, uh, like you say, crystal ball determination based on what they knew at that time. But, but let, let me just complete the answer. Oh, sorry. We don't let the assumption chase the expectations each year. Sure. And if you were to look at this plan as well as 200 of the largest plans in the country, it, it was a very slow progression for most plans from eight down to, I think the average now is below seven for most public sector plans. But now, the, with the, uh, raising interest rates, there could be a rebound going back up. But you'll see the discount rate um, probably tailing up. But we've always believed in, in a range, uh, not, not a single number. And the board then can make a decision on their risk preference. We want to be on the low end of the range or the high end of the range. And being on the low end of the range means you'll have more good news than, than not in future years. So it's uh, you know, being conservative versus not. Uh, being conservative. Okay, and ju just um, last question is, if, if we were to decide to align our discount rate with our anticipated return on investment, um, so therefore uh, we, we decided to change the discount rate to 7.5%, for example, um, 
that's going to substantially lower the city's annual payment, I suppose. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so $100 million or who knows, right? Right. Okay. And it's also going to lower the amount that the active employees pay, right? Because they're part of this as well. Yes. Okay. And, and it, would, it would not be, I mean, it's obviously a decision for the board, but it would not be an unreasonable decision for us to say, we believe, we sincerely believe that we can achieve 7.5% going forward and so therefore we believe that the discount rate could be in alignment with that. You're saying it's not unreasonable to believe that? Yeah, I'm so, saying, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, um, maybe I didn't phrase that very well. I'm saying would it, would it be a reasonable decision of the board, understanding that people may have different opinions about it, to decide that our discount rate should be in alignment with our anticipated rate of return on investment. That's one reasonable approach, yes. Thank you. And, uh, Cliff, I didn't realize that we named one of the options after you. <laughs> I, have I take one. it as a compliment. <laughs> so, I had one more question, if that's all right. Um, so going back to what the city did in the early or mid 2000s when we did the um, underfunding. Yeah, so the trifecta, because it was, it was both the underfunding, um, benefits were increased simultaneously and also coming off of yep. the dot-com bust. And, and by the way, someone asked the question, I think it was you, Bobby, that what did that cost the city in interest? And the underfunding cost over 200 million but then the city made up almost uh, half of it with uh, an overpayment one of the years. Okay, so so <clears throat> we went from 97% or so to like 67%, it was like a, over three or four years, like a huge drop. And yes. so at that time, what was the yeah, what was the decision process to of the board at that time? Because you've been the actuary the whole time? Uh, 2005 in October. Okay, so, okay, so yeah, so you were there. So, to, because they did a, I don't know if they call it glide path, but they did re-amortize the $1.2 billion, like basically 50% of the assets were amortized over, and that's why we have this, the cliff, right, is because it's the tail end of the re-amortization of those huge. Yes, but, but again, the cliff is only, only a cliff if you have level earnings every year. Right, but what what was the board, I want to understand what the board was looking um, at and why they decided to do that. It was a very chaotic time, you know, because several board members were, at least a few, I think were under indictment, the executive director was, uh, fund council. Um, we, we realized when we uh, submitted a bid and were hired, we found out later on we were the only actual firm willing to submit a bid. and uh, So, uh, the board was just trying to tread water here. <laughs> and so slowly over the next decade, we worked with the board to introduce a, a number of changes, not just the discount rate, but the funding method, uh, amortization periods, and we just slowly tried to bring the system back into a, a, st a stable position. And so it, it was just a, it was just one of many different things that was being considered by the board at the time. Yeah, and Brett, I, I just, totally agree with it was a chaotic time um, it's one of the reasons that the composition of this board is different now because there was a, uh, a ballot initiative or maybe the city council put it forward that changed the makeup of this board um, as mr. Kowarski says there were a number of people indicted I think those indictments ultimately went away I can't recall but I think the uh, the city treasurer if I recall correctly um, and other members of the board uh, f face some shortened uh, time in their position and so on. So all these things happened. And I think that at that time, there was a huge amount of criticism about uh, pension systems like ours and a huge amount of pressure under the idea that, hey, it's really unrealistic to think you're gonna get returns, 
safely returns over 6.5% over the long haul. And I think that was the, the rationale behind well, reducing well, the discount rate. Sorry. We dropped to 775. I mean, 65 didn't come to many years later. It was but it was, I'm sorry, but was it, uh, did it not happen sort of an agreement that this would slowly happen over time or this was um, we, we additional? We indicated it's likely it's going to happen, but uh, there was no agreement that okay. that would happen. It would periodically the board would review it again. And, Whenever there were, were a, a great returns, we also looked at those returns to buy down the, the discount rate. Um, and the expectations were dropping. You know, interest rates were very, very low for a long, long time. Okay. Thank you. If I can add to that, Chris, at that time, the board started reviewing economic assumptions every year. We still reviewed demographic assumptions at that point every five years. And it was fairly recently, in the last couple of years, that we changed our policy to look at economic and demographic assumptions once every three years because things had stabilized. But it was a year-by-year -year decision to look at the economic assumptions each year, look at what the investment consultant was projecting each year. And as Jean mentioned, we have consistently been within the ballpark of what the economic, what the um, investment advisors have projected. We've been very close to that, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. Um, but also going back to, to the big analogy, which is this is a huge aircraft carrier and it moves slowly and that's what you want it to do and so wide swings then looks at are you really looking at all of your funding objectives and so as you mentioned a change in the discount rate is a significant change in the payments of both the plan sponsors and the employees regardless of which way it goes so that's why we, we, we've been very slow and steady on this. And we've always said, if we need to look at economic assumptions or demographic assumptions more often, it's in the policy that we can, but we've, we've got that policy now that says once every three years, rather than the annual that we were doing when things were so volatile. So Marcel, are you saying that we can't look at the discount rate uh, for three years? No, I'm, what I'm saying is our policy says that at a minimum, Okay. We will look at the discount rate and the demographic assumptions every three years. And we will be looking at it this year. And we will be looking okay. at it this year because this is an experience study year. So Perfect. what is presented to you in September, whatever changes are made from that September meeting, if any changes, and there may not be any or there may be small tweaks, but whatever changes are made in the September meeting will be used at the June 30, 23 valuation. So they will impact the valuation that is currently underway. And it specifically says in our policy, once every, at least once every three years, look at economic and demographic, but it leaves it to the board's discretion to look at either or both more frequently if necessary. Okay, so perfect. So um, in September where you come back, you're gonna give us some, you would at least give us some, hey, if you change the discount rate to this, this would be the difference and so on and so forth. Yes. Thank you. Jean, quick question. Uh, is there any compelling reason from your standpoint that indicates we, we should change off our present course? Um, there's nothing compelling, um, but uh, I did mention that on the slide you have up there, uh, the rationale would be to, uh, since Prop B's gone, to go to level percent of pay, but it's so, the impact is so uh, minimal. Okay. And since, we're, since we have a, assumption changes coming up, it might be best to review all this after all that's done. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions on this issue for the board? Yeah, just so I'm clear, so from now until September, you will be finalizing these assumption studies and then there will be a presentation and decisions made at the September meeting. Yes. As to some of these moving parts, some of these questions that you, you pose here. And then those decisions will then be retroactively used for the June valuation of this year. That will right. that will <clears throat> then lock in the payment that that the city owes the pl uh, the plan. Is that for a the proper understanding? Them? Yes. Okay. Thank and, you. And despite the kind of big question mark, will you also bring in proposed glide path, whether to reamortize the UAL over 15, 20 years, just so we can see what that looks like? Because I I'm an attorney, so I'm naturally risk averse, my job is to keep my clients out of trouble and on the straight path. But I also, so we are, we're fiduciaries 
and uh, we're also, if you, well, since I work for the city, I'm, I will hopefully have a pension, um, <laughs> <laughs> assuming we all do our jobs. Um, right, so, so, but as, as long as we are making progress to, towards fully funding over time, and I don't anticipate the 6.5% going much lower than that, but based on decisions of the board, I, I, maybe it will, but the fact that we gained 10% towards, on the UAL, towards being fully funded on the funding ratio, over those that period of time from the reamortization and the discount rate went from eight to six and a half and the assumptions on longevity and things changed in kind of making it harder to, to fully fund, that makes me think if it's reasonable, depending on what those options look like, that the glide path isn't maybe as crazy of an idea or it certainly is in the realm of reasonable um, to me, so I would just like to see what those options look like. Okay, if, um, if, if I could interject. So when we do an experience study, really what you're doing is you're taking a step back and looking at our current set of assumptions and methodologies. Is there anything that the actuary recommends we change? And so they would come back and look at a lot of the different assumptions and methodologies and say, well, we recommend you do change the, the rates of termination or we change, we think you should change the discount rate. So they're coming proactively to do that. And so what we've heard from the actuary today is that they're, they're not recommending we make any changes. And so if they come back in September, they're, they're gonna give their recommendations. Now if this board wants them to do something else, additional studies, then we need to provide the, the actuary direction on that. So absent, sorry, I know you're like getting ready to talk. Um, absent, um, further direction from the board, they would not be coming back saying we recommend additional glide paths. So well, if I, there's I, additional information, then we need to, to provide that to our, our contractor here. I, I would be stronger that we would recommend against the glide path because it's so far out and, and that cliff is, who knows that that cliff's gonna be there. So you're fixing a theoretical problem. And so uh, I could see, you know, discussion about the floor and level percent level dollar, but the glide path that just seems way too premature to even be considering it. Okay, that's what I wanted to know what you were presenting, okay. okay. Any other questions? Good robust discussion, thank you. Gene and Alice, thank you very much for uh, your discussion. I appreciate your coming you. by and, and uh, educating us on this issue. Okay. Um, let me uh, suggest that we go through uh, Lana's uh, audit report and then take a break. Is that all right for everybody? Okay, good. So um, audit committee chair, Lana Rajenko, uh, if you could provide your committee report, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. I think they're both. Either one works. Good morning. <laughs> I don't know if my presentation is going to be nearly as robust and exciting, but I welcome any questions. Um, my name is Lana Radchenko. I'm the audit committee chair for SD SERS, um, and I'm going to give you a report of the uh, audit committee that we had on Wednesday, July 12th. Um, there was one action item in the meeting uh, on Wednesday and that was to approve the FY 2024 audit plan. Um, uh, the audit plan includes three internal audits. Better use my glasses here, wait a minute. Um, includes three internal audits, um, and then a number of other activities that are required by the uh, internal, internal auditor chair. The, um, Motion was approved by all committee members that were present, which was four to zero. Next on the agenda was uh, informational items. Uh, there were three uh, informational, uh, informational audit items. The first one was the FY 2023 uh, audit services plan, and that was a presentation done by MGO, uh, our audit um, firm, uh, by David Bullock and Craig Harner. Um, and they went through what the 2023 audit plan uh, scope of services and deliverables will be in order to conduct the uh, audit. 
The second item, informational item, was the FY 2023 internal audit report. So that kind of recaps how we did on the past, the past year's audit plan and if, if we have completed that appropriately. Um, and then it also reports on some required reporting of uh, internal audit standards and the SDSERS audit charter. The third informational item was uh, our favorite topic, Prop B, um, and it was an unwinding audit report, and that audit report was, the scope of that covered new hires, active employees, and rehires after July 8th, 2022. Um, so Sarah Dixon, our uh, chief internal auditor, presented that report. Uh, there were four findings and eight recommendations on that report, or on that audit report. Uh, next, there were uh, some informational reports that were given to the audit committee. Uh, the first one was, uh, again, Sarah. She reported, as we've requested her to do, on the uh, outstanding port district recommendations. Um, that's kind of a regular report that we ask Sarah to do every audit uh, meeting. Um, the IT division report was given by Michelle wagner Malecki. Um, and provided uh, a really interesting uh, update on the, uh, the things they're doing to mitigate risks um, in the, uh, the, the CalPERS move it data breach. So that data breach happened, and so we had some conversation about what, what are we doing to mitigate the risk of something similar happening at STSERS. Um, so that was very good. And she also introduced Norma Frank, who is a new member of the IT staff, and Norm is here <laughs> again, so that's great. Uh, the third um, report was given by Marcel um, on obviously the Prop B update. Uh, then we went into closed session, so on an annual basis we are required to um, do a performance evaluation of the chief internal auditor as the audit committee. Um, so we had a discussion regarding Sarah's um, FY23 performance, and we will be talking about that further in closed session uh, today, later in the meeting. Uh, then we went back into open session where we discussed, um, a uh, per um, our requirements, uh, the compensation for uh, Sarah as the Chief Internal Auditor. Uh, so Colin Brazil, our SD SIRS HR Director, who is also here, um, provided us with a comparative uh, salary information for similar, as similar as we can get, I guess, um, of other pension um, funds. And in that meeting, we recommended uh, a, pay, a merit pay increase of $10,000 for Sarah. Um, to acknowledge the uniqueness of this year and the audit of the Prop B that, that she did a fantastic job in. And that was approved um, uh, also uh, four votes to zero. The next audit committee meeting is scheduled for November 17th. Any questions? Lana, thank you very much for your um, report. Appreciate it. Um, Let's take a break uh, before we move on to Section 7 Disability Committee. So why don't we break for 10 minutes. If uh, we could all be back here at, say, um, 9.50. Perfect. Thank you.
Can we uh, corral the troops? Let's uh, try and get going here. Okay, are we ready to, uh, where's Chris? Oh, there he is, okay. All right, uh, I think we have our uh, members back in session here, good. So uh, let's uh, commence with the Disability Committee. Um, Tom Battaglia was unable to attend this uh, week's meeting and we are fortunate to have uh, Michelle Bush acting on his behalf. So could you please provide your disability report? I understand this is gonna be slightly different. Uh, a little, right. just a bit. <laughs> <Right. laughs> We're basically having a disability committee meeting here, but thanks, Paul. Um, our meeting was canceled due to a lack of quorum to vote on the action items. And so today um, we'll be bringing the items to the board to vote without a recommendation for the committee. We'll consider each item separately and I'll be asking for a motion in a second. The first um, item is the, to approve, the staff's recommendation to approve the industrial disability retirement application of Brian Jones. And Sandra Claussen's going to discuss that item with us. Yes, good morning. Welcome to Disability Committee. So now you all don't have to be afraid. You're all gonna wanna join this committee after <laughs> this meeting. Um, this is a recommendation to approve the industrial disability retirement application of Brian Jones. Uh, there's agreement that Mr. Jones's uh, industrial neck and right shoulder injuries do result in permanent incapacity and render his retirement necessary. Staff recommends that the board approve the application. Would any board member like to speak on this matter? May I have a motion in a second? I already have it. Rosie, do we have a motion in a second? We do. Um, we have Clifford Cheerson and Paul Lotz for the first and the second mover, and all votes are in as well at this point. And the motion passes 9-0, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. Our second disability agenda item is staff's recommendation to improve the industrial disability retirement application of Daniel Shepard. Yes, um, there are no substantial conflicts in the evidence that Mr. Shepard's industrial right ankle injury when he rolled that ankle um, and the subsequent surgeries he underwent do result in permanent incapacity and render his retirement necessary. So staff recommends that the board approve the application. Would any board member like to speak on this item? Hearing none, um, can I have a motion and a second? Rosie? A motion in a second. Yes, Madam Acting Chair, we have Paul Kaufman and Roberta Spoon as first and a second. And we are ready to vote. And with all votes in, Madam Acting Chair, this motion passes 9-0. Thank you. Um, our third disability action item is staff's recommendation to approve the industrial disability retirement application of Lonnie Wright. Yes, um, this last one, again, there's agreement that Mr. Wright's industrial bilateral hip injuries um, do result in permanent incapacity and render his retirement necessary. Staff recommends that the board approve the application. Would any board member like to speak on this item? No. Motion in a second. And a vote. Rosie, we have a motion in a second. Yes, we have Miss Lisa Marie Harris and Roberta Spoon as the first and the second mover. 
And the votes are all in at this point as well. And with that, the motion passes 9-0, Madam Acting Chair. Thank you. See, isn't that fun? <laughs> our, fourth and, our fourth and final disability agenda item is staff's recommendation to approve a continuance of adjudication deadline for Ramon Reyes industrial disability retirement application. Good morning. Uh, and this is a staff's recommendation to approve the continuance of the adjudication deadline for Ramon Reyes. Uh, Mr. Reyes requested that his application be continued past the one year deadline under Board Rule 7.60. We're requesting a six month continuance and we have a hearing date already set within that six months. I'm happy to answer any questions. Would any board member like to speak on this item? A motion and a second. And we have the motion and a second as well. Mr. Chris Brewster and Mr. Paul Kaufman have first and seconded. And now we're ready to vote. And with all votes in, Madam Chair, this motion passes 9 0. Thanks, Rosie. Thank you. Staff provided an informational item on amending Division 8 of the board rules. Johnny Tran is going to speak on that item. Sure, thank you. This is actually just an information item for the Disability Committee, given that the Business and Governance Committee is charged with making recommendations to the board. So it would have been a non-action item, and it will probably be covered at the B&G summary. So okay. I can take questions then if we want to wait. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, uh, for serving as our acting disability chair. We're going to move on to Section 8, Business and Governance Committee. Um, so, uh, Bobby Spoon, could you please provide your committee report? Sure. The B&G Committee met yesterday, and we had one action item, and that was presented by Johnny Tran, and it was staff's recommendation to... Oh, thank you. It was staff's recommendation to amend board various board rules. Johnny highlighted the change to the disability rules to remove the 30-day grace period for stopping retirement benefits when a retiree is found by the board to no longer be disabled and to codify that when a member requests documents to be sent to the disability committee or board members, the documents must be received by established deadlines to ensure the committee and the board members have sufficient time to consider the information. Additionally, Johnny highlighted a new city of San Diego rule where the city will be paying the interest due on corrections that were the fault of the city or SD SERS. And the committee approved all of these unanimously. Are there any questions from the board before we vote on this? Hearing none, I move the consent agenda item. Please record your votes. Okay. And with all votes in, Madam Chair, this motion passes 9-0. Thank you. Staff provided informational items on adding a board certification training to the approved list of educational conferences for board members. And Greg, Greg discussed this list. At our April 23rd board retreat, the board requested staff to investigate the National Association of Corporate Directors, NACD, directorship certification and its appropriateness as an educational opportunity for SDSERS board members. Staff found that this educational opportunity is appropriate for SDSERS board members and added this to the educational conference list along with a number of similar other courses. After that, staff provided division reports and operational reports and they are all included in your board agenda package. And that's the end of my report. I have a question. So um, now that the NAC certification is on the list, do we need to add our name to that or it's already approved for us to 
participate. So under our educational policy, there is a, a number of what I will say pre-approved educational opportunities mm -hmm. that the board members can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And the board certification, the NACD along with others are on that pre-approved list. Mm -hmm. We still have other, um, I guess, limitations on the amount of education the, the board members can take. But in, in shorthand, there's of the four additional conferences, that would be like one of the additional conferences. So okay. in regards to that, if you would like to attend, uh, you are welcome to register yourself or if you would like some help, um, okay. our wonderful board secretary, uh, Rosie would be glad to assist you. Sure, no, thank you Gary. I just wanted to make sure I understood the process. So now that's on the list, we don't have to add our names to that particular item. Correct. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, it would, be, it would count as one of the four opportunities in a, in a year. Yes. Okay. That concludes my report. Thank you. Bobby, thank you very much for your uh, committee report. We're going to move on to Section 9, Investment Committee. Uh, Cliff Shearson, uh, if you could take it from here. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the Investment Committee met yesterday afternoon, and we had um, a co we have a consent agenda of two items. And before we uh, talk about the consent agenda, does anyone on the board want to have one of these items discussed individually? That being said, um, the votes on these two underlying items were 4-0 in both cases, and I would move that the consent agenda items be approved. Would you like to cast that moving vote, Mr. Chair? Pardon me? Oh, I apologize. We have actually Michelle Bush did the moving, the first moving of the motion. Thank you. And we are open for the vote now. And with all votes in, Mr. Chair, this motion passes 9-0. So um, just for the record, the, um, should I read this into the record? Fine. Um, action item one for the record uh, relates to the fact that Aon presented the annual review of the SDSERS investment policy statement. SDSERS and Aon uh, reviewed and updated this doc re review and update this document every year to ensure that the policies in place remain up to date and appropriate for the investment portfolio and decisions made by the board. This year's updates focused on incorporating the changes that were approved as part of the annual asset allocation and portfolio structure reviews earlier this year. And again, this item was approved with a vote of 4-0. In, in a similar action, uh, there was a, um, a presentation by Makita, our real estate consultant, uh, uh, with their uh, annual review of the real estate policy and annual investment plan. There were no material changes recommended to the real estate policy the recommended investment plan for fiscal year 2024 sets the goals and pacing for the year, notably to commit to three to four non-core real estate strategies totaling $100 million over the course of the year. And again, this item was approved four to zero. Um, there were several information items, and for one of them, I guess, uh, Corinna, did you want to lead off in talking about the best practices review? Absolutely, thank you, uh, Cliff. So we reviewed at, at the investment committee yesterday a best practices uh, report from Curcio Webb. As you may recall, the committee hired, the board and committee hired Curcio Webb back in November to provide a best practices review. It was part of our fiscal year 2023 action plan. So we're here to present the results of that report to you today. Essentially, we looked at this area in terms of two phases. We divided the project in two phases. One phase was really dealing with governance and operational review aspects, and the other was looking at value for fees uh, in terms of what we're paying to our consultants and advisors. Just wanna give a little bit of perspective before I turn it over to Jamie, because I think this is helpful. If we have a $100 million mandate and we pay 20 basis points or one-fifth of 1% 1 to a manager to manage that $100 million for us, we will pay the manager for the year 
$200,000. To put this in perspective, you know, we look at the managers and their performance every quarter. The advisors that have discretionary authority, the management fees that we pay to GCM and Stepstone are in the neighborhood of three to five million annually on management fees alone. So I wanted to highlight this as a very important fiduciary exercise that we consider value for fees. What are we paying to our consultants? What are we paying to advisors? There's also an interplay between the amount that we pay, the services that we get, and the scope of the services. One of the key uh, outcomes of the analysis from Curcio Webb is to discuss delegation in trying to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the board. Uh, we're gonna unpack this in a little bit greater detail, um, but I would say that this harkens back to the ideas from our retreat that in a two asset portfolio consisting of stocks and bonds only, Asset allocation is responsible for explaining 90% of the returns. This does not include allocations to alternatives, and there's much greater dispersion across funds in private market space. But it is this idea that asset allocation really drives returns, and that's the highest focus, highest value add. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jamie Hamrick. Great, good morning. And I really wanted to give you a background on this best practices review and how it came about. So to start, as Karina mentioned, this best practices review was an item on the fiscal year 2023 action plan. The goal of the review was to determine the was to determine how to best maximize the investment program's effectiveness and efficiency. And this would be done through an independent review of the investment program's policies and practices in comparing SDSERS to not only industry best practices, but also to its peers. And then finally, this review could identify opportunities for improvement. So to truly have this independent review, an external consultant was best positioned to conduct the review. An RFI, a re request for information process, was done in November 2022, and we had three firms that responded to that. Curcio Webb was selected as the consultant best suited for the review. Curcio Webb is an independent, women-owned consulting firm that has been in business since 1999. The team, comprised of two senior consultants, has over 20 years' experience and has conducted over 80 similar reviews. So what was the focus of the review? Well, staff worked to develop this scope of services uh, for the review, and as you can see, the main areas are listed here. They were review of investment governance structure, investment policies, and the investment division procedures, as well as an evaluation of the fees paid to consultants for the services that SDSERS receives, as well as a review of the investment manager search process, and finally, a review of SDSERS risk assessment. So as Karina mentioned, the best practices review was divided into two phases. In that first phase, where we were looking at the governance structure, really focused on all the documentation that SDSERS uses. These are the policies, procedures, and the contracts for the consultants under review. That second phase, was focused on interviews with staff and consultants as needed. So what's next? Well, today you're going to hear from Phil Edwards from Curcio Webb, who will present the findings from the best practices review, and then we would like to hear feedback from the board on, on what your thoughts are on these findings. If appropriate, we could schedule an offsite to incorporate this feedback through an offsite meeting um, and then finally, would like to develop a plan to implement any recommendations. Yes, Cliff. Um, just for the benefit of the mm -hmm. full board, uh, b before we have the gentleman from Curcio Webb present, the investment committee 
meeting yesterday was unanimous in its view that some sort of offsite or focused discussion on the whole report would be beneficial for the whole board. Yes. So I don't think that's under debate in terms of our recommendation, oops, sorry, our recommendation to our colleagues. Great, thank you. And before we turn it over to Phil, I wanted to pause and see if there are any questions for Karina or me. Great. Okay, without further ado, we'll invite up uh, Phil Edwards of Curcio Web, and we'll uh, come back up when, when his presentation has concluded. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Karina and Jamie. Appreciate the introduction. I um, want to come to you today to uh, summarize our conclusions with regard to this policy review, and if I can leave three things with you. Um, one item is that for the governance practices, things are positive. Uh, I think they're moving in the, or we think they're moving in the right direction. I would point to the risk assessment as an example of that, and what we take from the risk assessment is that all the right questions are being asked, um, and all the right steps are being taken to uh, allow the staff, the investment staff, to be able to monitor and manage the pension portfolio appropriately. <coughs> From the consultant side, the value for fees, uh, again, generally positive. You have good consultants uh, working to help the staff and the board and the committee. Uh, there are a few items there that, that are subject to improvement, either in terms of the fees or in terms of the services that could be provided for those fees. Um, and the third item is, uh, again, what Karina and Jamie referenced, was uh, potential delegation of uh, responsibility to the staff. Um, let me stop there, and uh, those are the primary conclusions, and see if you have any questions before I jump into the guts of the presentation. Okay, fantastic. Um, this is, the, all these slides really talk about um, the information that Karina and, and Jamie had already provided to you. But in, in terms of the government, we would think that it's important to uh, consider delegating some of the manager selection, in other words, the implementation part of the decisions to the staff and allowing the staff to um, have the ability to pick the consultants they'd like to work with on that part. Uh, I'll go back and reemphasize what uh, Karina had said. The most important aspect of uh, the portfolio and the largest determinant of the returns, and you were talking this morning in the actuarial section about the returns, is the asset allocation. There is, we are not talking about making any changes to that. Our recommendations do not include any changes to any decisions the committee or the board would make with regard to the portfolio structure uh, or the substructure within that. It is simply once those decisions have been made, allowing the staff to make effective and efficient decisions with regard to implementing that portfolio. The second item is uh, uh, value for services. Um, we feel that Aon's fees relative to the current market are a bit above our benchmarks, um, and Stepstone's fees for several of their uh, products uh, that they offer are uh, also above benchmark. Um, this can be solved either by renegotiating fees or increasing the amount of services that you all get for those fees. So there's two sides to that equation. I would say the policy enhancements are uh, minor relative to the other two uh, areas that we've talked about here. Uh, and we believe that potentially consolidating some of the policies will help with efficiencies, eliminate redundancies, and eliminate the potential for conflict uh, across policies. The operations risk we thought was uh, potentially um, one of the strengths in this area. Um, again, we think the investment team in undertaking this um, uh, risk assessment was a very positive step. They've identified very concrete uh, steps to take to improve the ability to manage the portfolios. Um, in terms of this delegation uh, idea, um, delegating to staff uh, or to third parties uh, is a growing trend, and you can see the green bars in here are for pension plans, defined benefit plans. 
and it is a growing trend uh, across the industry to do this. And there are uh, several catalysts for this growth. One, uh, as we've mentioned, is allowing the investment committee and the board to have a greater focus on the strategic items. You know, the items you were talking about this morning for the actuarial part of it can have a much bigger impact. Uh, the funding of the pension plan, how you're gonna fund it, when you're gonna fund it, or is it gonna have a much bigger impact than which index manager you choose to populate that part of the portfolio? So uh, it allows the board and the committee to spend more of their time, more of their energy, uh, and more of their focus on the more important topics. Uh, timeliness and efficiency too. Um, sometimes um, there is a benefit to uh, moving between uh, board and committee meetings and having the ability to implement some of these decisions um, on, a, on a more timely basis. And it, and it clarifies accountability uh, for the roles and responsibilities as well. Let me stop again and see if anybody has any questions that they'd like to bring up. No? I just want to clarify on slide seven about the growing trend of delegation of, inve of investment decisions baked in, based on our conversation yesterday, baked, baked in these bars are outsourcing, providing capital to outsource CIO firms. So base, so to tease these bars out, it is a combination of delegating to staff and delegating to outside firms. You're as exactly a, right. As opposed to, I just want to clarify that this is not about just clear, delegating to staff. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Louis, maybe for people who are not on the investment committee, you could expand on what the OCIO might sure. look like in practice. Per the request of Professor Cliff, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a growing, uh, growing trend. There's a type of com type of companies out there called outsource chief investment officer OCIO. And so what happens is certain firms, certain foundations and endowments and pension plans will outsource completely to those organizations. So they, treat, they are both consultant, managers, uh, as well as investment staff, all in one uh, package. And so OCIO is a growing uh, part of the investment uh, landscape. Um, and it could be small funds, it could be billion dollar funds, it depend, and there's a number of reasons. It could be staffing issues, it could be uh, for uh, economic reasons that they're able to access better quality as opposed to having it in-house, but there's also a very strong argument to having in-house staff as well. Uh, so anyway, so that's what's called OCIO, and there's a trend to that, and so baked into these, to this graph is the idea of delegating both to staff as well as to OCIO firms. Great, thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead here to one slide that I think tries to capture, and there's a lot on this slide, um, so I wanna take the time to go through it and make sure you have a chance uh, to absorb it. But what we've done on this slide is, on the left-hand column, talked about some of the different roles, some of the different responsibilities, sorry, not the roles, but the responsibilities that are involved in managing a $10 billion uh, asset pool for a, a pension plan. Um, in the second set of columns where under where it says current, it indicates where the responsibilities for those roles lie. So for example, on the asset allocation, the staff with the support of the consultants um, make the recommendation and the investment committee and the board approve that recommendation. If you move down to align um, the fourth row, uh, manager vehicle and selection monitoring for public markets. Uh, again, the staff with the support of the consultants make a recommendation and the investment committee and board um, approve that. What we're suggesting, taking those two rows again, and what we're suggesting to change is we're not changing the top row, um, not suggesting that change whatsoever, but that fourth row that there be consideration of a change to delegate the implementation, for example, for the public markets to the staff, of course, with the help of consultants uh, in that. So the decision about, uh, again, which index manager to use or which public market manager to use to fulfill what the board and the committee have decided in the asset allocation would be left to staff. 
That doesn't mean that the board and committee abrogate that responsibility. They still have a fiduciary responsibility. You all still have a fiduciary responsibility for the decisions. And the staff, it would be incumbent upon the staff to come to you and explain what they're doing and why they're doing it and for you all to continue to ask them questions and, um, and talk about everything that's happened there. So again, the devil's in the details here. There are a lot of details. Let me stop again and, and ask if uh, there are any questions or comments on this. I have a, a quick question. Um, what's gained by transferring that responsibility to staff? Um, their uh, timeliness of, of decisions, and primarily timeliness of decisions and a better focus of your time on issues that will have a bigger impact on the overall outcome of the portfolio. So achieving that, I forget the number, I'm sure Greg will remind me the six and or whatever percent return on the portfolio, you know, that, that return will, um, you know, is largely based on the decisions the board and committee will continue to make on the allocation of the assets between stocks, bonds, private investments. And spending more time on that is more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Chris, can I just piggyback oh, real quick off of Michelle's question? Uh, can, can I would like to ask the flip side of that question. What are some negatives that we should consider in making this change? Um, it uh, concentrates the decision making in, in, in that body. Uh, and again, you're not abrogating your fiduciary responsibility. You still have a fiduciary responsibility for those ultimate decisions. The, the only way you won't have a fiduciary responsibility is if you don't have a pension plan, and I doubt that's going to happen. So, um, so you, ha you, 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 will, um, you will need to make sure that you are continuing to oversee the staff's uh, and what they're doing and how they're doing it. So it's, it's kind of like letting your kids grow up. <laughs> you know, eventually you gotta, you know, uh, let go, but you're still overseeing what they're doing part of the time. And uh, that's a hard thing to do. Um, it's not always easy. And when you've had that responsibility um, and delegating it to someone else is not always easy to do. So that's, that's probably the hardest part of it. So Continuing on that line, so we wouldn't be abrogating our fiduciary duty. Um, however, the the threshold, the basis for judging whether we've met our fiduciary duty, as an attorney, I think about this stuff. Mm. Um, if we re made a reasonable decision to uh, assign that that responsibility, the res end results of what they do don't automatically, let's say, they make some terrible decisions and the pension goes down. That doesn't mean we would be found to have breached our fiduciary duty if at the time when we made the decision with the information at hand, it was a reasonable thing that we did by um, assigning the day-to-day. The -day. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, I'm not an attorney, but based on my um, understanding of the court history, the courts have not second-guessed decisions that have been made in line with policies and procedures. What they have done is looked at the policies and procedures and said, you, you said you were going to go left and you went right. That's a problem. But they have not second-guessed decisions that have been made under the circumstances exactly how, you, how you've described. I um, had an opportunity to um, sit in on the investment committee meeting, and I, I think I share the skepticism of the group with respect to the level of delegation that you're suggesting. But I wanted to see if I could differentiate a couple of things here, because uh, when we get in, I, probably three billion or so of our investments are in index funds that are just following, right, and an and index. and. By and large, those funds, I suppose, are pretty plain vanilla, where one's about the same as the other. Um, probably the tracking is pretty similar and so forth. And the primary differentiation would just be in the cost of the fund. Um, whereas when we get into active managers, it sounded to me like that was an area where the investment committee was feeling that there ought to be a bit more direct oversight. 
So just a comment. I wasn't asking for a response on that, but but it just does seem to me like where we're getting into which index fund following the Russell 1000 or whatever um, we're going to go with. Again, I think the only differentiation is what what it's going to cost us. Thank you. May I comment on that? I know you didn't ask for a comment, but. <laughs> Um, but I think you highlight something very important, which is, you know, there is no set formula for this. It's not necessarily an all or nothing thing, right? And there is a spectrum of delegation that you can embrace. Um, right now, you're not embracing in that sector any delegation, and you can begin to embrace degrees of delegation, or you can put some guardrails around the delegation, you know. Um, on the index, maybe you don't want to put, to your point, you don't want to put any, uh, there's no need to put a guardrail around it, but on... Um, some active managers, maybe, you know, there are some conditions that you could put to make sure that they're not, you know, I don't think Karina and Jamie or any part of the staff would do this, but so they don't go, you know, too far off kilter. Yeah, but I mean, in that example of the index fund, so the guard rail we would put in would be essentially, um, we expect you to do a market analysis of yeah. who's going to give us the best rates. Exactly. and go do your best on in that particular area. And come back and report to us on what you've done. Right, thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Um, are you familiar with the uh, situation that we uh, had a while back with uh, Allianz, one of our investments? I'm familiar with what happened with Allianz and the structured yeah. alpha, yes. Not your particular situation, but I'm familiar with that in general, okay. yes. Um, and I, I'm hoping I'm asking the question correctly without putting you on the spot, but is there any indication that uh, following your recommendations, we would have uh, spotted the Allianz uh, issues earlier and reacted to them differently than if we don't follow your recommendations? Um, I don't know enough about the specific circumstances with the city, um, <clears throat> but I don't think it necessarily would have changed any outcomes in there. I think, uh, if anything, I think the staff is, it might have improved the outcome. The staff, because of their background, because of their focus, because this is what they do every day, and I'm not guaranteeing this, but may have been a better, in a better position to identify that and avoid it. So there may be a speed of response issue right. related to this that may come yeah. into play. If I, if I yeah, can sure. jump in on that, I, um, and, and I apologize, you're not privy to all the details of, of that okay. issue, but first of all, my attorneys say that that matter has been satisfactorily resolved. Um, so don't really want to get too much into the details of no, that. <laughs> but the way that uh, condition unfolded, uh, there was already some ability for staff to take immediate action um, in concert uh, with the CEO and the board president to mitigate our risk, and, the, and that worked very well. Um, so there was a, uh, a circuit breaker that yes. got tripped. Okay. So yeah. in, in that instance, um, I, I think it really would not have been uh, a measurable difference in how we address the risk of that situation. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great questions. Any Further? I don't know how much time you have left or how much more time you want me to spend on this. I could stop now if you like. You've sounds like you've had a full day or I can continue well, through. Well, I think uh, Chair Shearson said it very well is that uh, we really appreciated the tackling these governance issues and there was a strong desire by the committee to say, you know, we should continue this conversation. And so maybe doing that at a board retreat, we could actually have even more in-depth conversation as, as we go forward. So uh, what we were looking to see is, does the rest of the board feel that same way as the committee did? Should we dedicate some time to further discuss this report and explore some of these governance issues? Yeah, I would, su I would support uh, taking another look at this in more depth at an offsite. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm in support of it, and I'd like to have more discussion at the retreat about just more pros and cons of these governance issues. I think that we should defer to the investment committee's decision in having a retreat. Thank you. Support. Bill? 
This has been terrific. Thank you. You had a long presentation with us yesterday mm. and a, a second go around today. Thank you again for coming. Thank you and, for uh, your for attention. Your support. And um, with that, what time is your flight home? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, we have a couple of other information items uh, to cover. Uh, two are uh, related to each other. Uh, there's an ESG review of private market managers that Jamie um, presented, and then a, the results of a manager diversity, equity, inclusion survey that Demetrius presented. As relates to the ESG review, uh, the investment division has been working to implement a framework for monitoring and reporting ESG data for SDSERS private market managers. This involved issuing an ESG questionnaire to each real estate manager along with SDSERS <coughs> to private equity and infrastructure advisors. The results of the questionnaire indicate that all of SDSERS private market managers have policies in place to promote their ESG efforts and the vast majority have dedicated ESG resources in place as well. SD SDSERS will continue to monitor and report on this annually. And this, of course, complements work that has been done previously and reported previously on our public markets managers as relates to ESG. On to the uh, DE&I uh, survey. Uh, as Demetrius uh, talked with us yesterday, the investment division also issued a survey to track diversity information for all of SD SDSERS investment managers. Specifically, staff looked at the percentage of gender diverse and racially diverse employees at each organization. Staff also collected data on diversity at higher levels of each organization and on how the percentages have changed over the past year. This will allow staff to track each manager's progress in promoting diversity in their organizations. This report will also be updated on an annual basis. Um, there was a report by Anders on our investment manager searches uh, and uh, the, the presentation detailed staff's work to implement the changes approved as part of the portfolio structure review at the May meeting and in particular fixed income searches. And then finally, uh, there was a report on performance for the quarter ending March 31, not June 30th. Um, and we had both Anders and then the uh, Katie and Ashley from Aon. For the first quarter of 2023, the total fund had a return net of 2.4%, underperforming the benchmark, which returned 3.6%. Underperformance relative to the benchmark was driven by the Opportunity Fund, particularly the Managed Futures Allocation, which struggled due to short fixed income positions, which detracted as yields rose sharply in March. SD SDSERS public market investments generally performed in line with their benchmarks for the quarter. SD SDSERS is outperforming its benchmark over the trailing three-year and 10-year periods and since inception. In addition, the plan's risk-adjusted returns are in the top quartile versus public pensions of similar size over the past three, five, and 10 years. That's it. Uh, one clarification there, the uh, yields actually uh, fell sharply in March on the um, Silicon Valley Bank. A regional crisis. So what happened with the managed futures managers is that um, they were short duration as rates were rising. That was the trend, rising rates. And being in this short duration posture, uh, then when rates fell sharply, that disadvantaged these managers. Thank you. Cliff, are we done on your end? Thank you very much for your uh, investment committee report. It was a lot to digest. So let's move on to section 10, um, questions and comments. Uh, do we have any questions, comments, or uh, educational session reports from the board members themselves? Just, one, ahead, just one, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to n note and to thank Karina, the uh, memo that she sent to us about going out and renegotiating our costs and how that should going forward save us $638,000, which is not chump change as they say. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's Hello. Yeah, that's on an annual basis going forward. I also want to thank the team as it was a team effort on the um, behalf of uh, our staff. 
All set. Any other comments? Good. So let's move on to section 11, which is closed session. Johnny, are there any discussion items for closed session? Yes, we have a few, Paul. Okay. We're going to talk about the litigation, the exposure to litigation, as well as your evaluation of the CEO, the chief internal auditor, and the chief compliance officer. So at this time, if you could clear the room, that would be great. Okay. So thank you very much, Johnny. We're going to section 11, closed session. So for staff, consultants, and visitors not invited to participate in the closed session, would you please leave the room? Rosie, uh, you can stop recording and uh, while we're in closed session.
Thank you so much for <laughs> your patience, everyone. Ready to proceed, Mr. President. Okay, thank you very much, Ro Rosie. So uh, I believe we're done with closed session and um, we're gonna return to open session at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Colin, for your discussion items, but I'm gonna ask Johnny to bring us back into open session and discuss thank you. litigation. Yes, thank you, Paul. I just want to report um, out of closed session that the SG Sears versus Blanco matter was settled. And that's it. Good. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to move into section eight, which is the public employee performance evaluation. I believe this is on the CIO. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> CIO. The internal audit position. Thank you. Yes. Excuse thank me, you. Sarah. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Colin. Okay, thank you. There, uh, just the last two items. One is the CEO's uh, salary study that I provided with you just for review. No actions required at this time. We will discuss the salary in the September meeting. So that's just something for to help you determine any appropriate adjustments for the CEO. And then finally, I am seeking approval of the $10,000 increase that the audit committee has approved for our chief internal auditor. So that will require a vote. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. But at this point, all I need is approval for that. Do we need a motion on this? We need a yes, motion. we okay. need it first. Okay, uh, I don't see anything up here. Thank you. Are we voting electronically? Oh. Or? Sorry, current items. Oh, here we go. Oh, so uh, this is moved by Michelle. And do we need a second? I think we need a second on this. We do not need them. We don't need a second, no, okay. Mr. President. We are ready to vote on it. Yeah, it looks like we. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Okay. Because the vote thing isn't working, I'm going to request a show of hands. Is that all right with you, Rosie? Um, sure. Why don't I just do it via roll call? Would that work? Oh, wait a minute. There it is. Sorry. So this is motion. I've got it. I've got it. Well, you're special. I'm special. Okay. Shall I just proceed by? doing roll call instead, uh, and then I record the vote accordingly. Go ahead, Rosie. Paul Kaufman. Yes. Lisa Marie Harris. Yes. Brett Bartolotta. Yes. Chris Brewster. Yes. Michelle Bush. Yes. Paul Lotz. Louis Gwynn. Yes. 
Clifford Cherson? Yes. And Roberta Spoon? Yes. And with all votes in, this motion passes 9-0, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, so uh, I think it's time to adjourn the meeting. Is that, oh, sorry, Greg, do you have something else? I do. Okay, I, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Let me see my CEO remarks. Are there questions and comments? And if this would just, I, and I apologize, I know it's been a long day, but <clears throat> I really wanted to start by recognizing Lisa Marie Harris for being hand-selected for the inaugural 50 Women to Watch for Boards list. Whoa. And yeah. nice. This is a significant honor. Uh, there were approximately 400 talented candidates and in contention for this recognition. And Lisa Marie was one of the very few selected who rose above the rest due to her excelling in leadership innovation and commitment to excellence. So congratulations, Lisa Marie, and thank you for being on our board. Appreciate that. I'd also like to recognize Paul Kaufman and Cliff Shearson for their continued board service since our last meeting. Both Paul and Cliff were unanimously approved by the San Diego City Council amid quite numerous uh, complimentary comments by council members uh, to serve on a second term on the SDSERS board. We are very fortunate to have your continued service and leadership, so thank you both. I'd also like to recognize and thank SDSERS disability team member Cheryl Wilson, who retired after 16 years. Uh, she was instrumental in running our disability process. She was part of the team that started with Sandra Claussen all those years ago when um, the disability backlog uh, was tremendous. And during her career, she actually brought stability uh, to the process to find out where we are now, where we are well within our processing timeline. So, we appreciate Cheryl and we are gonna miss her tremendously. But relatedly, we we're pleased to announce an internal promotion of Andres Molina. He was here today, but he's not here at this moment um, to the disability team and he was previously in our call center. So it was nice to bring somebody internal and, and have them uh, start in more challenging position. I'd like to thank, uh, recognize and thank Cynthia Queen, who willingly accepted a very difficult task to focus solely on completing our retirement benefit best practices projects as it relates to member services division. Uh, she is, we are leveraging her absence by having a couple of our team members um, in the member services area, uh, two of her staff, namely Victoria Fedelizo, hello Victoria, and Jessica Taylor, hello Jessica. And they're gonna be taking turns overseeing um, in a management opportunity program uh, filling in for Cynthia while she's on special, special assignment over the next three months. So really excited about that. I would like to recognize Karina Coleman for sharing her thoughts, perspectives, and life experiences in a recently published Emerging Manager monthly article titled Women and Minority CIO Hires at Largest Public Pensions and Nonprofits Show Hope But Progress Remains Unstable article. And I appreciate her engagement and making time to share her story. So thank you, Karina. Hopefully you're listening. I would like to recognize, and finally, I'd like to recognize our information technology team for managing a very difficult scheduled power outage in this building, which started the afternoon following our May 12th SDSERS board meeting and carried over into the weekend. And staff, as an organization, we were left wondering why the building would schedule a power outage on a weekend where families were supposed to be celebrating National Buttermilk Biscuit Day, National Windmill Day, National Dance Like a Chicken Day, but most importantly, it was Mother's Day. And tr the troubles that resulted from the building shutting off power included the computer room, air conditioner not restarting, and everybody knows the blinking light boxes do not like the heat. A city uninterrupted power supply got interrupted failing, uh, causing the SDSERS email and website to crash. And an issue with the AT&T where SDSERS uh, could not receive phone calls to desk phones. So it was very disheartening to learn that those mopping up this mess needed to cancel their family plans to ensure the SDSERS information systems were brought back online. So a special note of thanks and appreciation to SDSERS staff, Michelle Wegner, Malecki, Sean Kilpack, staff at Zenzar, A.O. Reed, and AT&T, who worked through Mother's Day weekend away from their families to remediate our failures. So thank you very much, and this concludes my remarks. Thank you, Greg. Any other comments from the board? Okay. So I'd like to announce the adjournment of this meeting, finally. 
Our next meeting is uh, September 8th uh, here in the uh, SEC. Nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope so. Okay. That was weird uh, how it stopped working. I know, it's very weird.